Welcome to the D Dwarf Fortress tutorial. My name is Onigato, and uh, I'm going to be going through here, turning this eventually into a uh, Let's Play after we cover the basics. Uh, very first thing is I am going to be using Dwarf Therapist. This is a very useful tut uh, utility. I do recommend it fully. I will not, however, be using any of the graphics packs that are available. I will make a link available though in the uh, discussion section below. Uh, very first thing obviously you're going to need to do is to download and uh, extract Dwarf Fortress available for free. Uh, I'll have a link for that. And also want you would probably want to get either the Lazy Noob Pack or just get Dwarf Therapist and uh, download and, and extract that one. Also free very first thing you, that you're going to see whenever you start Dwarf Fortress is a animation and uh, we've already gone through there just got that loaded up and you're going to see create new world and some of these other options are available uh, design new world with advanced parameters is an advanced option if you want to go through and hyper customize your world you can do that Object Testing Arena allows you to put little what-ifs together. Uh, is steel armor better than copper armor, better than iron armor, for instance, against various specific weapons? You can test that out. But we're going to create a world here and actually go play. Yeah, my computer's little bit on the slow side, so it's going to take it a minute to get to the screen. Alright. Now, the very first thing you can do is choose your world size. The larger it is, the more stuff you have in there. And that ranges from uh, Forgotten Beasts and Titans, but it also includes different sites and makes it a little bit easier to find locations to start with. However, the larger the map is, the more CPU cycles it takes to build. So for this, we're going to run with medium. Now, I typically go with large when I'm doing for my own, but we're going to start with medium. <coughs> History is the maximum amount of time that can occur after world creation. And you can interrupt the process but the shorter, the, the faster you either interrupt or the shorter you set your time, for instance here, very short, maximum of five years, uh, the shorter amount of time, the less time there has been for certain things to occur. Civilizations can't expand as far, uh, and they are less likely to interact with certain beasts, like Forgotten Beasts and Titans and other really big things that exist before the world exists. I typically go for short and actually interrupt it usually about year 50-ish, maybe as late as 80. Uh, if you really wanted to, you can go set it up to run a thousand years of history. And it will run a thousand years of history. There will actually be a great deal of civilizational advance and there will be all sorts of things created, crafted, made, and people will live, grow old, and die. Entire civilizations will rise and fall in a thousand years. This is incredibly difficult for your computer to calculate after a while, even if you have a really good one. I typically interrupt it after 50, 60 years anyways, because, well, I just want to get into it. So, the number of civilizations is actually relatively important. When you have a very low number of civilizations, there's a very good chance that the only civilization will be your dwarven civilization that sent you out. And that's it. No humans, no elves. There will probably be at least one goblin civilization, but maybe not, and there may not even be on the same continent as you. So you may never have to deal with goblins. But it also means very little trade. Very high means that you've got 
not just humans, elves, dwarves, and goblins, but you've got different cultures of each one. A uh, very high setting you'll probably see between four and six uh, distinct dwarven civilizations formed, and probably an equal amount, you can't really be sure, but a e fairly equal amount of humans, a fairly equal number of elves, goblin civilizations, that kind of thing. Uh, it means that you've got a lot of neighbors around. Which can be interesting for some people. I mean, It definitely means you are absolutely guaranteed to have trade of all sorts, unless you're on an island. We're going to go with a medium here because it's a good balance. You're definitely going to have you know, at least one other civilization of humans and elves, and you're going to have goblins on the map somewhere, probably close enough to be able to raid you, but we'll fix that problem. The number of sites controls the names of locations, and I'll show you what that means in a bit, but it also means that there's different ways the com the, the game actually generates the world. And it's a bit of a complicated you know, thing. There's a lot of depth that's available there. I typically go with either high or very high, just because that makes a bit more fun when it comes to looking at the story that's developed. The number of beasts. Uh, this is, for the most part, uh, regarding large creatures, titans, uh, forgotten beasts, other very big, very dangerous things. But it also involves larger versions of natural creatures. Uh, so if you have very high beasts, you're going to have a lot of basically every kind of beast, be it a cow, a dog, a dingo, wild versions of all of them. But it also means you're going to have a lot of the potential for forgotten beasts to show up and wreck your life. Very low means that any given site is less likely to have anything on its map. Uh, you're not going to have a lot of animals around. So we're going to go with medium here. Savagery also modifies what kind of creatures you're going to see. Uh, with a very low savagery, you're going to see not necessarily benign creatures, but creatures that are less likely to be aggressive initially. Uh, so you're going to see normal versions of dingoes, normal versions of wild yaks. You're going to see normal versions of, of different animals but you're not going to see very big ones and they're mostly not going to be aggressive. Very high means uh, things are more likely to be high, very aggressive and they're more likely to be bigger. Uh, elephants and tigers and other very large creatures that are more likely to want to take a, take a bite out of your dwarves than anything else. Uh, I'm going to get, actually leave this on high you know what, I want to move the number of beasts to high. We don't have to choose a site that has a lot of beasts or a lot of uh, savagery, but it's interesting to see. Mineral currents. When the game f generates the world, it actually follows quite decently the laws of geology as we know them meaning that sedimentary layers are actually laid down by the game in sedimentary methods. Uh, it initially generates you know, an igneous layer and then generates, creates metamorphic rock from the pressures of the world lasting over it. and It does this all you know, year one before anything actually exists, but it actually generates it in a logical way. The mineral currents level Allow, changes the way that certain things like gems and metals and other useful materials form in these rock layers. Uh, very rare, 
is difficult to uh, survive and makes for very few viable sites. Uh, frequent or everywhere means that you're going to have a lot of minerals scattered pretty much everywhere. Well, especially on everywhere. Uh, makes it a lot easier to find a really good site to embark on. We're going to start with frequent here and we'll just go through here, make sure everything's the way I like it. And keyboard Y to go. Now your computer is going to automatically generate, the game's just going to generate a whole bunch of different worlds. Now you can see here seven different worlds have already been rejected. There's not really any way of telling right like this why they were rejected, just that they were. Uh, there are ways you can turn things on so that it'll tell you how and why they were rejected. But now it's got the world created and it's actually generating history. You can see some of that history starting to move along. Here's a road that's just been built not too long ago. Here's another road, some human settlements. Uh, we're 30, 40 years into it. And we've got some people who are very important. A lot of people have died, a thousand people. And my computer's starting to chug a little bit, so I'm just going to kind of stop it here. This is a good time frame for it. We're 55 years into the into history, so we've got a bunch of events have happened. People have been born, people have been died, uh, people have created interesting things, uh, there have been wars fought, beasts have been killed, all sorts of interesting things have happened. And we can actually see that in a little bit. I'm kind of liking the way this world looks. I don't think we really need any more history, because, yeah, I don't really need history that much. I like it a little bit earlier in the universe. So we're going to use the world. Now if we wanted to post this world, we could just export the image and info and go put, you know, that information available on, like, a forum or something like that. But we don't really need to. And now we're going to go use the world. It's offloading all of those people who have been created. All 5,576 of them. They exist somewhere, and this the game knows exactly where they are, and what they want, and what they're going to do. do, 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 do. And it's saving the world, and it's saving the world. Unfortunately, my computer is not the best in the world. I'm doing this on my laptop, so... There we go. Now that we've created a world, we can actually start to play in that world we've created. So I'll start playing. There are three main modes to Dwarf Fortress. Uh, there is the Dwarf Fortress mode, which is the mode we're going to be actually doing. And that is kind of like the Sims meets Dungeon Keeper meets homicidal, alcoholic, naked dwarves with really bad tempers. Uh, adventurer mode, you take the... you are actually playing as a single character. Uh, you gather up companions and you go around, fight monsters, get loot, save, you know, people and, and you just go through and you do all sorts of adventures and uh, eventually you retire and uh, then there's legends mode and legends mode is where you can go in and you can view all the historical events that have ever occurred on this world and you can look at every single solitary person or beast or anything that exists on this world which as you saw, there was over 5,000 of them. That's a lot of people with a lot of stories and a lot of history. But every bit of it is stored in the Legends section. And as we actually play through either Dwarf Fortress or Adventurer, you actually continue to increase the number of Legends. How you interact with the different legendary creatures is all in there. So, but we're actually going to go to Dwarf Fortress itself. And this
this is going to be the embark screen. You have here the three different main windows. You have your world view, which is very compressed. Uh, each of these little squares is equivalent to about six squares, maybe eight squares, I think. And then you have the regional view, which is most of the world. You can see how uh, here we have you know, this coastline here matching up with this coastline here. And you can see all the way up to about here-ish, I want to say. Yeah, right about here on the world map. So you can see a good deal of the world, but you can't see all of it. And then you have the local map. And this is the actual where you would be embarking to. Is this little negative color space box here. And you can move this box by using the U, H, K and M keys. And your mouse is basically going to be completely useless for 99% of the stuff in here. Uh, you can, your mouse defaults to being on, but you really can't do a lot with it anyways. So, no point in using it. You can also change the size of your embarkation site. You will increase it vertically, M decreases it, H decreases it horizontally, and K increases it horizontally. Uh, the size of your embarkation site does make a difference. Uh, bigger embarkation sites mean that you have more pathing options, which can actually mean slow, slower response, especially as your fortress starts getting bigger. To move around on the regional map, just use your arrow keys. Or you can even use your number pad, because that's kind of the you know, way you move around. Um, don't worry if you don't understand what all the symbols on the screen mean. It is ASCII, and you'll either understand it or you'll get a, a, a pack and you'll just do a different tile set than I do. But the basics are these where the cursor is right now are very sharp mountains very sharp mountains in fact these are slightly less crazy mountains but they're still mountainous this is a shrubland and is kind of foresty but not as foresty as this area here this is actually some very happy hills very good areas. Unicorns and uh, other happy creatures live there. And we will not be, because that's boring. This is Tundra, and it is very cold, and it is a very difficult place to play on. That does not mean that it is impossible, it just means that it's very difficult. This would be Arctic Ocean, and glaciers because down here this is the pole and uh, quite frankly it's frozen solid now let's take a look at that looks like that is something evil it is that is a necromancer's tower that little right there necromancers command undead but it doesn't look like he's actually got a lot of stuff around him yet. I'm kind of surprised. He must have just established his tower not too long ago. Okay, so, uh, if you're paying attention, you'll see on the upper right-hand corner a lot of information going through as I move around. And basically, what it is, is information about what I'm looking at Really? Tainted ocean in the middle of... Okay. Uh, what I'm looking at inside of the embarkment box here. Right here, I can see that this em the biomes, there are two different biomes here, and each biome basically controls 
what type of stuff you're going to see inside of it. You know, most sites will have one or two biomes. You'll see occasionally three or four biomes. A little bit rare to see more than that. Actually, very rare to see more than that. But you can actually look at each individual biome by hitting F1 and F2 and then so on and so forth. If you have three biomes, you can hit F3 to see the third, F4, so on. So here you can see the green flashing marks. That indicates that that is where biome number one is, Temperate Ocean. And if we look at the second biome, it is also Temperate Ocean, but it's a different Temperate Ocean biome, so there's slightly different what creatures will spawn there, what kind of stuff happens, that kind of stuff is a little bit different. This is an interesting ocean. It's an inland sea of sorts, I guess? I mean, this is ocean over here. That's normal ocean. But you could actually embark on this, I think. I wouldn't want to. Difficult. Um, you can see here, it is temperate. There are no trees there, probably because it's covered in water. There's no vegetation of any kind again, because it's covered in water, and it's actually relatively evil. In fact, very evil. All sorts of evil effects will be occurring here, uh, rains of blood and plague and necromantic effects just happening, so if any creatures die, they come back as undead. Very, very nasty. But there is a little soil... There's an aquifer, which can be troubling, and there's metals, all sorts of metals, not too... There's shallow metals, and there's deep metals, so it's an interesting site, but not for a tutorial. Actually, rather than just going around searching all over the place, we're going to go search for a specific location. We're going to find a location. You can set how big you want your embarkment site to be, 6x6 six six is what I go with. Uh, you can control the savagery. The higher the savagery, the more, again, the more aggressive the creatures are likely to be. Not necessarily that they will be, but they are likely to be. Uh, anything that has an NA is just something that the game won't even look at. It'll completely ignore. So we can have low savagery, which is relatively civilized, and not a lot of really big beasts. Medium savagery, which is some beasts, um, a little bit more likely to be finding beast men and stuff like that. And then high savagery, you're definitely going to be seeing some beast men and other things. Frankly, I'm ignoring both it and evil. I'll be able to see an evil sight if any of them come up, and we'll just choo not choose any of those. Elevation. Uh, this is the difference in minimum elevation and maximum elevation on the site. So low is fairly flat, medium is rolling hills, or possibly light mountainous, and high elevation, you've got some cliffs going on. Which can be actually really cool, but... Mm, we ignore that. We don't care one way or the other. Temperature. Uh, one thing about uh, Dwarf Fortress, the worlds only have one pole. Right now, the pole is south. And it's going to be cold here, and it's going to be fairly hot here. This does make a difference. Uh, cold temperatures can freeze your dwarves, and it definitely freezes water. So any surface water can be frozen solid, like this is glaciers. It's nothing but frozen water, which makes it kind of hard for your dwarves to get a drink. Uh, if it's too warm or too hot, surface water will just evaporate, and you'll have to find water some, uh, somewhere else. Uh, hopefully you'll find either an aquifer, which is very difficult to deal with uh, if you don't know what you're doing, or you'll find a uh, underground cavern with water in it, which, you know, if you get lucky, yeah, you'll find that. If you don't get lucky, your dwarves will die of thirst. Not a good thing. 
the um, we're going to ignore that because I'll be able to see that but uh, if you want to set something either set it for medium or high you can typically deal with evaporation better than you can with freezing the amount of rain how often it rains I mean that's pretty straightforward uh, dwarves sometimes get they they get uh, unhappy thoughts if they get caught in the rain and the more often it rains, the more likely they are to get caught in the rain, obviously. Uh, the, therefore, the more likely they are to have unhappy thoughts. Drainage is pretty much how many ponds and how big the ponds are going to be on your map. Low drainage means that you're going to have a lot of just standing, stagnant water. Medium drainage means they're going to have smaller ponds, they're going to be easier to deal with, and they're going to be usually closer to any rivers or other water sources that you have on your, on your map. High drainage means that those ponds are going to be a lot smaller, a lot easier to deal with, and, you know, you're more likely to actually have soils and clays and similar things. Uh, we're going to ignore that, actually. Fluxstone. This is a simple yes or no. Fluxstone is uh, a product, a stone, that you could dig up made up of typically a calcite of some sort. Limestone, actual calcite. Uh, or a stone that was once a calcite and is now a metamorphic rock, like marble. Fluxstone is used in the production of steel. You take iron and a fluxstone, burn them together in a smelter, and you have pig iron. Take pig iron, a uh, fluxstone, and well, actually you need another piece of coke in order to do it, and you can turn that into steel. So fluxstone, very, very important if you want steel, and you want steel, because it's the second best metal in the game. Aquifers are underground water. And this sounds like a really good thing. It's not. It literally means stone that is an infinite source of water. And if you dig into this stone, it can drown your fortress out really quickly. It will almost certainly drown some dwarves very quickly and makes life interesting. Uh, for the purposes of this tutorial we're going to go with no because, well, you don't want to have to deal with aquifers right away and if you don't know what you're doing, aquifers are very, very deadly. Uh, but we do need a water source of some sort. Dwarves need water in order to take baths. Dwarves need water in order to to keep injured people alive because an injured dwarf can't drink alcohol. A healthy dwarf only wants alcohol, but an injured dwarf can't have alcohol. So you need some sort of water support supply from somewhere. And stagnant ponds don't work very well because it's stagnant water. Ew. Uh, shallow metals, either none, yes, or multiple. Yes means it's going to find at least one metal. And that metal could be copper, it could be brass, well, actually not brass, but it could be tin, it could be uh, iron, or it could just be a couple other different metals that are in the game. Multiple means it's finding at least two different types of metals within typically the first 20 to 30 levels from the surface. Deep metals, same thing, but deeper. So typically between 30 and 60 levels from the surface. You want either some soil, a little bit, or you want some clay. You want clay. Uh, clay can be used to make certain things that can be useful, for, mostly for trade, 
but pottery can be made into a special type of barrels or a lot of different things that are really actually quite useful. Soil uh, is required in order to, soil or clay are required in order to do farming unless you do irrigation which again gets into water control which is a fairly advanced concept. So we're going to look for a little soil. This means the soil probably isn't going to go more than two or three levels below the surface of the, of the area. Some goes down to about five to ten. Deep goes down to maybe thirty. Which dwarves like sleeping in stone and I don't want to have to dig down thirty levels just to get to stone. So let's find a little bit of stone, soil. We're going to ignore clay. And once we're ready, we can go through and start the search. So, what it's going to do now is it's going to go through, and over time, you're going to see these red X's appear, and these are sites that are no good. And you're going to see some green X's appear, and those are sites that are actually useful, that match all the parameters we've put in. The more parameters you put in, the less likely it is to find a site that exactly matches what you're looking for. But, the more likely it is that any sites that it does find are exactly what you're looking for. Now, depending on your computer, this can take a couple of minutes. And as you can see on mine, it's going to take some time because it's got 81 sectors to search and it's finished 11 of them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause for a minute and just let this run. Okay, so it's finished. It only took it like five minutes, but that's not bad. So now we have a bunch of little green X's that are flashing at us, and it'll automatically choose one of them for you as your possible embark site. But let's go ahead and browse around. So let's go hit Escape we now know that we like these sites and okay so this very first site it found has two biomes in it the first biome is a hot mountain no trees of any kind that's kind of a downer moderate vegetation though that could be useful wilderness so a little bit of wilds but not too too bad I do see one big problem though, right there. Necromancer's Tower. If you're within eight squares, eight of these squares, of a Necromancer's Tower, you end up with Necromancer Invasions, and it's no fun. Although, man, that would be an awesome site to go to if it wasn't for that tower. Sure, it's hot, which means that surface water is just going to go away, but it's a woodland, so you got lots of trees for things like beds and stuff like that. Moderate vegetation, which means you've got a lot of uh, plants you can harvest for food and other secondary uses. Wilderness means that it does have a lot of creatures on it, so there's good hunting. Plus, it's got clay, some soil, which means not too deep, but not you know, it got a couple levels, so you can do some farming underground. Shallow metals, deep metals, and flux stones. No aquifer in this spot. But evil. Very, very evil. So, we're going to say no. This is a tutorial, not a death wish. Uh huh. What do we have here? We don't have clay, but this is actually really good. Uh, should mention the temperature extremes. Hot on one end, you can actually have heat exhaustion, heat, you know, heat stroke, that kind of thing on your dwarves. Uh, water evaporates basically year-round unless it's the rainy season, and it's, you know, not necessarily a bad site, but it's really, really hot. On the other end, down here, you'd have freezing, where water is basically frozen 
solid the entire year and there's just no chance of getting any surface water whatsoever. In between you're going to have cold water is frozen except for mostly in the summer you might have some right at the end of spring and right at the beginning of autumn uh, you have temperate which you have frozen surface water from through most of winter thaws out in fairly early spring and doesn't freeze up again until late autumn warm where it's only frozen surface water at the depths of winter and then hot where you just you never freeze and you have a pretty good chance of just evaporating all the surface water off uh, let's see this is actually a really decent site let's see if let's see the other biome eh, that's not bad I mean it doesn't cover most of the map at least that does cover most of everything I've got here. Well, let me take a look here real quick. We're going to move this just a little bit. I typically prefer to make sure that the river is on one side of the map, not running through, just because it's easier to dig under a river when it's only a little bit in your way, not all over the place. And now we're solidly inside of just one biome. A warm woodland, so we've got lots and lots of trees for stuff. Moderate vegetation, decent wilderness, so we've got hunting, but not too much of it. We can see on the map here we've got uh, dwarven civilization not too far away. Actually, pretty extensive civilization there. Uh, some human civilization over here. Some more humans over here more dwarves over there so looks like we're in a decent place here far enough away from that stupid tower that we shouldn't be affected and uh, this is actually a really good spot so go ahead and search your, your own maps because yours are going to be different than mine find yourself a site that you like and choose embark so E okay now I've actually gotten a uh, uh, preset combination here, but you'll probably, unless you have some of the packs, uh, Lazy New Packs will quite often have pre gen sets for uh, preparations. And we're actually going to use the Ready Player One set here because it will always do that. Okay. This is your preparing screen to get ready for different things. Uh, the On this screen you can set up certain you can set up your dwarf skills and if you hit tab you can actually bring stuff with you. Typically very important stuff. Like right now I'm bringing three copper picks, two copper axes, an anvil, a lot of rum, wine and beer, some plump helmet seeds, uh, some food of various types, thread, cloths, uh, good for medical purposes and other things, bags to hold stuff, ropes to tie stuff down, quivers to hold, uh, air to hold crossbow bolts, some buckets to haul water around, splints and crutches just in case people get hurt, and a proper crossbow to go hunting with. Also got a dog, a female and a male dog. Uh, breeding happens as long as there are two opposite gendered creatures of the same species on the map anywhere. Uh, if you have the male at the surface in a cage, and the female just happens to be you know, 70 levels down behind a solid stone wall with no, absolutely no way of getting to her at all, she'll still have puppies. Also have cats, male and female. Uh, cats are very useful for keeping down vermin and other ick stuff. Uh, four chicken hens and one male chick who will grow up to be a rooster eventually. 
hens are really good for getting eggs, and eggs are a really good source of food for your dwarves. Two female geese, and one gosling, male. Also, eventually breeding purposes, but you have to let the one grow up. A uh, couple of things. Rabbits are useless. Absolutely useless. You cannot get food off of them. You cannot get fur. You cannot get hair. They are useless. They are. They do make decent pets. Lots of things make decent pets. Cats make great pets. Dogs make great pets. Rabbits, useless. At least you can eat the dogs. And yes, you can eat the dogs. Uh, same thing goes with any cavies, if you see those. Ah, there they are. Cavies are also useless. Decent pets, they breed worse than rabbits, and they just are useless. Absolutely useless. So, we're going to actually take a look at the problems, because it says... Okay. Well, that's why I have 32 points available. We're going to go back to the, to the uh, peasants screen. These are your se seven dwarves. Hi, dwarves. Now, I've set this up a little bit already um, so that I have some dwarves capable of doing some things. These two will be my mining dwarves. And the reason why I'm not actually giving them any skill points is that they will skill up very quickly on mining. I'm going to have them mining almost constantly. And they'll become very good at mining very fast. The higher their rank in their skill, the faster they would mine, but they'll rank up so fast it doesn't matter. This dwarf is our woodcutter. He is also a carpenter. That means he can make a lot of stuff out of wood. Uh, beds, doors, barrels, all sorts of nice things that are really useful in a fortress. This dwarf, we're going to go over to the list of skills and page down, is going to be our doctor dwarf. He has been trained in wound dressing, diagnosing wounds, surgery, which is so the combat system is capable of doing things that are rather spectacular. Like if you if your dwarf stabs somebody, it can actually penetrate the spleen, tear the pancreas, bruise the fat, and do all sorts of other things like cause bleeding. And all of that will actually apply to the target. That means that if somebody does that to one of your dwarves, now they have a lot of internal organs that need to be fixed, which needs surgery. Uh, wound dressers just take cloth and they apply it onto the wounds. Kind of useful, but, you know, make sure they don't die. Bone doctors set bones. Uh, they go through and make sure that anybody who needs traction also gets into traction correctly and they can help make sure that people heal a little bit faster if they have broken wound bones. Suturer, he closes wounds with thread. So This guy is actually getting customized and we're going to call him Doc so that we know who he is. If anybody wants their uh, dwarves name, uh, wants a dwarf, ugh, wants a dwarf named after them, leave a comment, and I will get you a named dwarf. The Tust is has been set up as a basic leadership role, so he's pretty decent at persuading people, negotiating, lying. This means that he can actually be useful as a trade character, as a trade dwarf, uh, and it also, because I gave him a, appraiser, organizer, record keeper, he's actually also pretty, he's novice, but he's still better than just your basic dwarf at keeping the books, so I can turn him into a manager, I can turn him into a record keeper, 
And without a record keeper, you have no idea what's in your fortress. I have this many stones. Well, I know I have that many stones, but I don't know what kind they are. I don't know exactly how many I have. I just have rounded to the nearest whatever. So, record keepers, very important. Organizers, using the manager to create jobs is a very good uh, way of managing big deals. Like, uh, if you need to make sure that you will always be getting wool from animals. You can set up a job to uh, with your manager to shear animal and it'll shear an animal anytime it's available. Otherwise it might just cancel the job and therefore never show up again. Alright, this guy... Ah, this is our... Uh, he has been set up to be a grower and a brewer. Uh, so when he arrives, he'll be farmer. Actually, I'm going to customize this guy and call him Leader. Because that's kind of important. We know he has all sorts of skills. And this guy is going to be Hunter. Uh, ambusher is the hunting skill and I'm going to make him really good at that. And he's going to be good at butchering and tanning so that uh, as he kills things, he brings them back, turns them into meat, and then t uh, tans any leather that he, or tans any hides that he gets off of it into leather. Leather can be used to make a great deal of things, mostly clothing uh, and for trade goods. So really, really quite useful. Okay, so don't think I'm going to give anybody any more skills. But I am going to need some more stuff. I couldn't get any cave fish, just because they weren't available, and I had those kind of set up in before. But that's okay. What I can do is hit N for new, and I can get new things. Now, what do I want to get? I can... Hmm. Well, I do want some food, so I'm going to get... Eagle meat. I'm going to get... 16 units of eagle meat. Because eagle meat is tasty. Alright. Now, if we really wanted to, we could name the fortress, and we can name the group uh, using Shift-F to name the fortress specifically, and Shift-G to name the group, but, eh, who needs to? It's a fun thing to do, and there's a really big list of different things you can call things, but I'm not that interested in that aspect. So we're going to embark. And it's going to generate the specific location where my dwarves will be. And that's why it's taking so long right now. Uh, on my computer, typically, it only takes about two, maybe three minutes. So I can keep chatting, I guess. Usually. I don't think it usually also has to deal with the fact that I'm also recording video either. So, fun. Come on. take this long. I've never actually had Dwarf Fortress crash on me like that, so... Ah, there we go, there we go. And we have arrived. So, uh... We have arrived, seven dwarves, very few supplies left. All the supplies you saw, of course. But it is spring, so we have time to grow food and hunt things and... Well, possibly fish, if it was safe, but I don't know if it's going to be safe. Ere the leopards get hungry. Oh dear, there might be leopards nearby. Okay. And this is our main screen, and... I've been going for about an hour here, we're getting close to the limit. And 
so I think we're going to hold it up here and uh, come back uh, next video we'll start talking about setting up our actual fortress and going through and and uh, making sure where our dwarves are secure and safe and well fed see you later